Romans chapter 5 and I'm going to read from verse 1 through to verse 11. And that's the passage we're going to look at uh, this evening. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. But while we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some one might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for, toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Well, may God bless his word to us. Let's pray as we come and look at this passage. Lord our God, we thank you that for many of us we have been familiar with your word for many years. And yet, Lord, we know that there is always more light that can break out from your word. And therefore, Lord, we pray, grant us that light. Grant us to understand your word better and to respond from the heart to that word. Lord, we ask it so that we may glorify you in our living and so that we may praise you from our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. There are things that stick in your mind. I used to go each year to the um, the minister's conference run by the group of churches that the church I was ministering at belonged to. And the normal pattern that was that you'd have a very gifted minister speaking and some of them were now retired and looked back at many years of service to God. And one particular favourite of mine was Eric Alexander. He was a minister up in Scotland and I'd heard him speak on a number of occasions at the Keswick Convention and so on. And so when he was speaking, I was particularly keen. What advice was he going to give us? What gem might I pick up? And it really did stick in my mind. He expressed a regret about his ministry. And it was this, he said, just said, I wish I had pondered more. What's pondering? Pondering is not just reading something, it's, if you like, chewing it over in the mind. Or it's like a traveler, he's going through the desert, he arrives at an oasis and he stops to enjoy it and to savour what it is like. And I think it's, it hit me particularly because that's something I'm not very good at doing. So I, I'm constantly feeling a bit guilty and I really need to work on that one. But also, isn't it just so obviously something we need to do? Each part of our life seems to be busy and pressurised. If you're working, you feel busy you feel pressurized. 
If you're looking forward to retirement, let me promise you, when you're retiring, you feel busy and pressurized. It doesn't, it doesn't improve in that respect. And so you're conscious, here is a need to slow down and to think. And I think one of the things that I became conscious of as I was looking at this passage is that there are parts of God's Word that are, if you like, designed like that. There, you've, Paul in Romans has been, if you like, following an argument. He's been driving something home. And it's almost in Romans 5 to 11. He, he stops and he says, well, look, let's think about this a bit. Let's spell out what this means for you and what it means for me. The first part, if you like, is the river is flowing really fast. Uh, he's established, he's arguing because there are things he needs to convince them of. Uh, early on in Romans, he talks about this, doesn't he? That um, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So he's talking about a reality. God is angry with sin and therefore he is angry with those who sin. And what he does as he goes through these early chapters of Romans is to deal with the ways that we might try and wriggle out of this one. So some people will say, well, look, that might be true of other people. It might be true of murderers or muggers. It's not true of me. I'm fundamentally a good person. Or even... I'm fundamentally a religious person. It's not just that I try and be good and I take the standards that are around me. I actually try and take God's standards and I try and put them into practice. And what he sums it up in a couple of verses that are very powerful. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So he's saying, look, Here's the ultimate. God tells you what he wants you to do. What's it going to achieve? It's going to tell you you haven't done it. It's going to tell you that you've failed. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now he's established that, but he establishes it for a purpose. The purpose, that what he wants to achieve is, if there is no hope in you, and what you can do, and how you might obey God's instructions and commands. Where does hope come from? He says, but now a righteousness, that's what we need in order to be justified right with God. A righteousness of God apart from law, the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, for all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see the point he's making, if all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the only way we can be right with God is if he makes us right with God, if he creates righteousness for us. So we're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, he's then that is really it's like a river in full force. It's you're not you're not meant to be able to stand up against it. He wants to carry you along by the logic of it, so that you realise that salvation comes through Jesus and faith in Him and all that He has done for us. Well. He's done all that. And what he does in Romans 5, 1 to 11 is to slow down. What are the blessings? What are the things that we can be really thankful for that come to us because of the Lord Jesus Christ? And as you look at the passage, you'll notice that there are, well, it's, it's obscured in different versions of the Bible. Uh, I'm going to read three things that are causes for rejoicing or boasting 
or glory, depending how you choose to translate it. They're all the same word. In verse 2 of chapter 5, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In verse 3, not only that, but we also glory, and it's the same word, so you could translate it rejoice. We glory in tribulations. And then finally, in verse 11, we also rejoice in God. So three things. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in tribulations. We rejoice in God. The word and the reason for having all the different translations is quite a good one. Um, the word used would normally be translated boast. So is boasting a good thing? Answer, no. Because someone boasting, it speaks of pride and arrogance and them asserting themselves and them feeling in some way that they have put themselves in credit with God, doesn't it? And I think it's only after he has absolutely clearly demonstrated that you and I cannot put ourselves into credit with God that he then uses this term. And I think it's quite deliberately provocative. What have we got to be proud of, to rejoice in, to be, to glory in, to exult in? All of it comes to us from God. But he uses that term, I think, very deliberately, almost to sort of shock us into thinking, wow, this is remarkable. This is a really strong way of putting it. So three things for us to rejoice or to boast in. Firstly, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What does the gospel do? We hear the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ and we believe it. What's accomplished in our lives? Well, the gospel regains for us what we had lost, doesn't it? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How were we created? We were created to know God. Um, and that's very simple as you read the early chapters of the Bible. Here are Adam and Eve. They're in the Garden of Eden and God walks with them. He spends time with them. It's natural for them to be with him and though his glory is real because they haven't fallen short of it it's not frightening it doesn't repel them and when someone's converted they have a hope of the glory of God and I think in some ways that explains for us when someone becomes a Christian you know, before you become a Christian, it would seem the most unnatural thing in the world to be a Christian and to believe Christian truth and to respond to it. It just, just seems, you know, why would you? you? You weren't brought up like that, your life wasn't like that, and you're being told that, well, this is what you need. When you become a Christian, a lot of people describe it like this. It, it's, it's almost a sense of coming home. You know, this is what we were made for. This is what we were created for. It's, it's not a strange alien thing. Somehow it seems right to us. Why does it seem right? Because that's what we were made for in the first place. And the gospel regains for us what had been lost. How does it do it? Well, having been justified by faith. What does justification mean? And it's very often, and this is part of the gospel, of course, when we believe the gospel, our sins are forgiven. Now, justification is not, happens alongside that, so everybody who is justified, their sins are forgiven. But justification is more than that. Justification is God declaring that someone is in the right. Now, how are you in the right? You're justified by faith. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because of what he has done. 
He has dealt with the punishment for your sins, but he has also lived a perfect, righteous life that is credited to your account. And that changes everything. You're justified. You're right with God. You've got this expectation of, of um, the glory of God. You've got peace with God. Everything is right. I'll just, just think about this for a moment. Um, most places, you, when you say, oh, well, it's quite peaceful there, you perhaps an office you work in or a situation you're in with other people, what do you mean? You mean at the moment there's nothing provoking a fight. But you know that in human situations, actually the most peaceful situation is precarious. Something may happen, everything changes, and suddenly it's an unhappy situation. It seemed great, we were so glad we were involved in that situation, and it's all gone pear-shaped, it's all spoilt. But we have peace with God. Everything is as it ought to be with God. Now that's, that, that's what he's saying, you see. It's not, there is no underlying problem that will resurface. You have peace with God. Things are as they ought to be, and he describes it in another way. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Well, what is grace? Grace is God's undeserved favor. But what he is saying is that that situation of peace, this grace in which we stand, that is a permanent condition. It doesn't change. You believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're at peace with God, and you have a standing in grace. All of those things are true. And a wonderful thought, isn't it? We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In a sense, we've got a foretaste of it now, but the reality is that one day we will be with God in his glory, and it will be wonderful, but it will be right and natural for us. It will be how things ought to be. And what he's saying is, look, that's a result of the gospel. Just think about it when you believed these things became true of you and then he goes on and this is a i think in some ways it's vital that he makes this step but it's a huge one to make we also boast or rejoice in tribulations that's verses three to eight now the first one, that's fine. I rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That is an obviously good thing. Well, what's the definition of a tribulation? It's just something that's unpleasant and that I don't enjoy. It's, um, it's, it's hard to go through. Nobody enjoys it. So to rejoice in tribulations, how is it that any body can rejoice in tribulations and the point is that they will come in the Christian life, won't they? They're inevitable. I mean, they're, they're inevitable in human life. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwards. They're inevitable, though, in the Christian life. Um, Romans eight seventeen it talks about, you know, being joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. The pathway to glory with Christ is the pathway of suffering with Christ. So you're a Christian, you're going to suffer because you're a human being, and you're going to suffer because you're a Christian. There's going to be tribulation. You don't rejoice in it for itself. You can't because it's unpleasant. Why do you rejoice in it? You rejoice in it because of the purpose that God plans to accomplish through it, through what he's doing in you as you go through these difficult times. And I think this is a, a basic problem of the Christian life because so often in the New Testament you find it repeated. Um, recently I've been preaching in James chapter 1 
Now, it uses different words, but the thought is exactly the same. We rejoice in tribulations. James chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. It's exactly the same thought, isn't it? Um, What happens? Well, we glory in tribulation knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. James knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. What is produced? You keep going in the Christian life. You go through a period of difficulty and suffering and sadness. What do you do? You keep living the Christian life. In one sense, you don't need to do anything, do you? You were living the Christian life before, You were praying, you were seeking to be obedient to Christ, you were seeking to witness. You're going through a difficult time, what are you doing? You're praying, you're seeking to be obedient to Christ, you're seeking to witness. Nothing's changed. You just keep going. But the point is that develops you. It's, if you like, it's when you exercise to build muscle, you exercise against resistance. And in the Christian life, faith exercised against resistance is strengthened. So, tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character. You go to James, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. They're both talking about the same thing. They're talking about developed Christian maturity. But it's a complete reversal, isn't it? Someone who's not a Christian, they're going through a bad time. What is the only thing that they can hope in it? It doesn't last. It'll be over. For the Christian, they can actually say, look, even as I go through it, I'm benefiting from it. It's doing me good. It produces mature, settled Christian character. I think it's simply this, that as people live the Christian life, how do you start off as a Christian? Well, you probably start off on cloud nine. Not everybody does, but let's take it. You start on cloud nine, and then you hit the troubles and the tribulations, and then you struggle, and you battle with it, and you wonder if God really loves you, and it all becomes really hard. But... A mature character, they are steady. They keep going. And he's saying what comes out of that is actually hope. It's a looking to the future. Uh, It's pretty much the same in James. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. When he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. It's the same idea in each case. But what he's saying is this, look, You're living the Christian life. You go through difficult times. You continue living the Christian life. You develop mature character. What does it produce in you? It actually produces a discontent in a good sense with the life you're in. Would you like your life to go on in the same way forever and ever and ever? No, there's a hope, isn't there? There's a desire for the glory of God. There's a desire for the crown of life. So actually, you go through these difficulties, you can thank God for them because it would develop you as a Christian, but that actually isn't an end in itself. You're going beyond that. And he tells us what sustains us while all of this is going on. Because this is, I I think, it's repeated so often in different ways throughout the New Testament, simply because it is such a big problem to us. So basically, the New Testament writers, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they tell it you this way, they tell you that way, which is very similar, and then they tell you again. I remember one mature Christian actually saying that he felt every time he went through a time of tribulation and difficulty, he just had to learn the same lesson all over again, and it always felt as though he'd never learned it before. Well, that's what it's like. 
But what, why are we not disappointed? Why don't we give up the Christian life in disillusionment? Well, he tells us hope doesn't disappoint us. There's something that the Christian has that actually keeps them going when it's tough because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. What separates the Christian from other people in their view of God? They know the love of God. And they know, and what sustains them, they're going through a tough time and other people think, well, I don't know why you don't give up or I don't know why you don't... If God treats you like this, how can you put up with it? Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you fall out with him about it? But there's an awareness. He talks actually, within the heart, God's love is poured out. It's The Christian has an awareness of God's love that is totally different to other to what other people have. And it would be very easy to say, wouldn't it, look, this is wishful thinking. You know, you're going through a really tough time. You know, why don't you just give up? Why don't you give up on this faith, this talking about the Lord Jesus? Because it's obviously not working for you. But the Christian knows it's not an illusion. And the reason they know it's not an illusion is not simply that the love of God is poured out in their hearts, but that's what you experience inwardly, if you like, it's subjective. But there is a reality, there's a truth that lies behind it, and he spells that out in verses 6 to 8. We were still without strength. In other words, he's looking at us as non-Christians and saying, look, you were helpless, you could not turn yourself to God. But what happened, you were without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, what is an ungodly person? An ungodly person is opposed to God, they're going their own way, they're hateful in their lifestyle and what's going on within them. Christ died for people like that. How does he die for us? He doesn't die for us because we're good people. He doesn't die for us because we're potentially good people. He dies for us as ungodly people, people who are opposed to him and hateful to him, but he puts his love on us. And he just argues it out for, for us. But just... He might, well, just think about it. Look, scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone might even dare to die. No, could you imagine sacrificing your life for someone else? I think the answer is that some, pe- some people will say, well, yes, you know, someone who was really dear to me I could conceive that I would choose to die rather than having them die. I I, I can understand that that happens. There's perhaps a strong sense of comradeship, of sharing things together. Yes, we might die for some, but in a sense, by doing that, we're just affirming that they're worthy of us dying for them. But he says, look, it's not like that. Verse 8, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, Christ's death is for us as sinners. That's the state we were in. That's the state we're in by nature. It is not he died for us as potential saints. He died for people who were sinners. He died and made them saints, but... That's not why he died, because of what they would be. He died because of what they were. And it's something that just seems unnatural, doesn't it? Here are people who are opposed to God. Here are people who are offensive to God. And God shows his love for them by sending his son to die for them. It's one of the ways people have... I think often misunderstood the gospel 
it, it's pictured almost like this. Here is God, God is judge. What happens? Jesus intervenes. God would judge us. God would condemn us to hell, but Jesus, out of love for us, steps in. But that's not what the Bible says about the cross. What does the cross reveal? It reveals the love of God. It does reveal the love of Christ, of course. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. But it reveals the love of God. It's the God who is opposed to us, the God who is rightly wrathful to us, loves us and his son dies for us and we can be brought into this situation justified peace access by faith into grace rejoicing in hope of the glory of god and so the christian firstly rejoices in hope of the glory of god we understand that then the christian rejoices in tribulations and that's a bit harder to understand but he does it the christian rejoices in that because he knows the love of god and he knows that god's intention towards him in sending tribulation is actually to mature him and prepare him for his pre to be in his presence and then finally the christian rejoices or boasts in god much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him for if we were enemies we were reconciled to god through the death of his son much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life now god loved you as a sinner that is clear isn't it he loved you when you were ungodly but in loving you and sending his son for you he changed you you are not what you were and what he says is look this transforms the way in which god may act towards you you know you've now been justified by his blood what was your situation before you were condemned you were condemned because of your own guilt and because of your own sin what's happened now god accounts you as righteous he declares you to be righteous because his son died for you because jesus christ's blood was shed therefore he now justifies you right so now you're justified it means you're right with god well how much more shall we be saved from wrath through him in christ what is there to be wrathful about that this is the point isn't it you're justified you're right with god god has now no cause to be angry with your sins as one who is in christ because they're dealt with you've been justified and in case you haven't got that verse 10 puts it a different way and it talks about it you, you look at the way in which what we were has been pictured ungodly sinners enemies for if while we were enemies you know we were opposed to god and god was opposed to us that's the situation it's a it's a situation really it is the whole picture is you know that it doesn't mean warfare has broken out and god is pouring out his wrath at that moment but it means there is every cause for that to happen and that is what you would anticipate but if you when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son you know we were opposed to him and now the whole situation has changed god was the judge who was justly angry with us but he's transformed our situation he's reconciled us now that's a change in us that we have come to love god it's a change in our situation with god not that god is caused to love by this but he can express his love freely towards us because of this that's the difference we're now reconciled 
His outward attitude towards us turns from wrath to love, and that's something that may be experienced because we're in Christ. But he says, look, if now you're reconciled, well, you're not going to experience God's wrath. Well, clearly, you're going to experience final salvation, aren't you? You belong to Christ. You're united to him. You know, his death intervened to save you from God's anger. But Christ continues to live. And he, you belong to him. You will not be separated from him. You will be finally saved. And what he's saying is, look, you understand the gospel, and that was given generously to you as someone who God was rightly angry with, but that's not now the situation. God is no longer angry. So what would you expect from him? You expect final salvation. You expect actually the glory of God, to the hope of the glory of God. But what he says is, and this is, if you like, the he's going right down to the foundation. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, what is the position of someone who isn't a Christian? They may be awed by the wonder of who God is. They may be angry at God because of who he is, but... At best, they would stand in awe. Here is someone of boundless perfection. And the catch is that that boundless perfection is something against me. You know, how do you rejoice in that? You can't, can you? I mean, the existence of God is a threat to people. Remember reading an extract from a book by an atheist and he, he was very honest about what he was what he what he believed he said look i do not believe there's a god but then he was very open he said look and i don't want to believe there's a god you know the last thing i would want is that someone could demonstrate to me that god exists that changes everything here's someone who's come to faith in christ They've received the reconciliation. God is their friend. He's their loving Heavenly Father. They love him. You rejoice in him. Well, it, it simply anticipates what Paul is going to say later on in Romans. Uh, he's, he's simply going to make the point, if God is for us, who can be against us? No. If this God is our God and is on our side, and is bringing about our salvation, wouldn't I rejoice in him? You know, when we come to worship, what are we doing? We're rejoicing in our salvation, evidently, and so we should. We're rejoicing that God gives a meaning and pattern for our lives. So even the things that we experience as, as rotten and upsetting, have a good purpose in our lives. But ultimately, isn't it this? This is my God. This is my friend. This is my Father. Everything has been changed absolutely and completely. And I just invite you, you, the book of Romans, I read it through recently. I, have the, I try and read through the Bible, New Testament, a couple of times a year. So... I read through the first four chapters of Romans and it's like being caught up in a river. It's relentless. He is every hope that we have of ourselves is battered down. But it's only battered down so he shows us Christ. And he shows us what Christ has accomplished for us. And that means we have every cause let's say, it, to boast in God. You know, what do we boast about? We boast about the things we're proud about. We're not meant to be proud about ourselves. We are meant to be proud of him and all he's done for us. Let's pray.
Lord our God, we're thankful, O Lord. We, we thank you for the sheer wonder of our salvation, for the sheer wonder of sins forgiven. Lord, we pray that we might learn to live as you'd want us to live. Give us grateful, thankful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>